Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at Casper versus Ethereum. So we've done two previous videos where it's Casper versus Elethium and then Casper versus Bitcoin. So today we're just going to be going through and comparing Casper coin to Ethereum. So you have this sheet here that we're just going to look at and we're going to go through a bunch of links that I've put in here and we're going to compare the two. So firstly, that we're going to start off with always is transactions per second. So Casper right now is currently running, I think, around 400 to 300 transactions per second. And when the Rust update actually comes in, we can have a transactions per second of, I believe, from 2,500, if we look here, all the way up to potentially 20,000 transactions per second, depending on the blocks on the network. So we know that this Rust testnet is going on right now. And that's basically to iron out all the implementation of Rust into the mainnet version. So here we have max blocks per second and TPS. It does say 32. We're currently running on 10 blocks per second on the update. And it could even be pushed to 100 blocks per second with total transactions of 6,400 to 20,000. So right now it's only doing 400 transactions per second. But this Rust update is coming in very soon by the looks of it, as in the test net is going very well. So we're probably gonna see this come in within the year, hopefully, and then there's other things implemented on top of that, which will help the network. When we go back and we look at Ethereum's transactions per second, they're nowhere near Casper's transactions per second right now. So we're at 400 even right now, and Ethereum's only currently working with around 20 to 30 transactions per second. If we go here, we can see on the transactions, this is how many transactions per day, and then this is the TPS of the network. So, so currently operating on 33.7 TPS, which isn't very quick in terms of when you look at other cryptocurrencies out there. Mainly the one that we're looking at today is Casper, but even Alephium is way quicker than what we're seeing right here. So in transactions per second, definitely blows it out the water. And even when we're moving down to the second one, which is transaction time, you can see that Casper has a one second block time. So transaction times don't really need to be improved and they're not going to be on the Casper network because they're already at one second. So this can go further up to, I believe, five to 10 seconds on the network, but that's of the higher ranges of transactions. Most of the transactions will be completed within the second. So there might be, you know, 95 percent of them within the second and then smaller percentages as you go up into one two three four five six seven eight nine ten seconds on the network and if we look here this is just a graph inspector showing the actual network going on right now so we can see that transactions is one second block times so there could be two but that will average out as you see here four there and then it goes into one so on average around one second block times with Ethereum, we have 13 second block times. Now these were now these were actually very irregular. As we saw with Casper coin, it's not exactly one second per block. But with Ethereum, when it was on proof of work, this was the same thing. It could go up from, you know, could have six second block times and then it could go all the way up to 24 second block times. So it averages out to 13. But right here we have pretty consistently a 13 second block time for Ethereum. As you can see, this is just a visualizer and within the next 13 seconds, as we see here, we have a new block. So on average, it's 13 seconds and they've got that average pretty much down after the move to proof of stake. So we can quite confidently say that it's gonna stay at 13 second block times and increasing it would be a very hard feat to do for the Ethereum network right now, just based on how they built it back in the day when they did build it, they didn't really have the foresight to use it as a currency in regards to one second block times. Now, when it comes to fees, this is the one thing that's plaguing Ethereum a lot. And I believe it has the highest gas fees or highest fees of any network out there. So currently right now, Casper is operating on a very, very low fee. So if we click into here, we can see down. If we scroll down, it, it does say something about the transaction fees. If we keep scrolling, so it's 0.001 CAS per UTXO fee. And then if you convert that into dollars, that gives us this figure. So 51 of a cent, basically. I think it's one thousandth of one cent. And then obviously with Ethereum, they have way higher gas fees. Average right now is around $20 as of this date, but it has been higher in the past. Going all the way up to $150 per transaction. So 
we're seeing right now is around 20,000. And then previously when Ethereum and Bitcoin's prices was going up in December, we saw really high transaction fees right here, you know, 50, 60, 40 dollars in transaction fees. And this is what Casper is obviously aiming to do is to kind of sort out these problems that if seen in cryptocurrency, so transactions per second, the move to proof of stake coins that necessarily didn't need to be done, and also the transaction fees. Now, when it comes to mining, Casper is built on K-heavy hash, a very efficient algorithm for mining and processing transactions. So there's no memory hardening on this algorithm. This is why it was very easy for ASICs to come onto the network and the gap between ASICs and GPUs is very, very big in terms of the efficiency that they can get. And this is because there's no memory hardening like there was on Ethereum mining. So the difference between GPUs and ASICs is very substantial when compared to Bitcoin mining with a GPU and an ASIC, so back in the day. We've already reached the full progression to ASICs. Emissions are based on a curve over time at an increasing rate, so there's no strict block halving. The official block halving would be every year. However, over the months, if we look at this chart here, we can see that the emission schedule actually goes like this. So a lot of it has been mined so far. I believe we're around 75% of the supply total and ASICs came on the network at around 65%. So GPU miners have had their time to start mining on the Casper coin network. And now it's ASICs time to accumulate a bit more of the network and it goes over to 191 months. If we scroll down here, that will be in 2037, which will be the end of the supply. However, if you just take this example here, if we keep scrolling back up to where we are now, we're in 2024. Let's say that we're in the first month, which is 138. If we go to 2025 on the first month, we're around 70. So it's basically a halving of a year, but it's over every month. So this is why mining on ASICs is becoming less profitable is because of that emission schedule is very aggressive. Now, Ethereum, when it comes to mining, obviously there's no mining anymore. It's moved to proof of stake. And this was trying to address the gas fees that we're seeing here. So the reason that they tried to do this was to limit the gas fees. It wasn't going to increase transactions or anything like that. It was just strictly for gas fees. Because if you look over the last three years, they saw the problem of the high gas fees that they're seeing on the network. Nobody wants to pay, you know, $50, $60 to basically send cryptocurrency. And even up to 474 right there on May 1st of 2022. So that was an extremely high time for gas fees right there. And nobody really wanted to pay that. So the whole point of moving to proof of stake was to address those gas fees. So the only problem is it didn't necessarily have that effect on the ethereum network so they're still working on that because it's moved to proof of stake now minimum amount to stake is 32 ethereum so this is where the centralization decentralization conversation comes in is because when you're actually staking into a binance or a coinbase you're not actually owning the node because you need 32 ethereum to stake into that node and that's around eighty thousand dollars at today's price so it's heavily centralized in the way that you would need more money to run more nodes, which would give you more power over the network. As I said before, if you're staking into a Binance or a Coinbase, you're basically staking into their nodes. So they're going to collect a bunch of Ethereum and they're going to stick their 32 Ethereum into a node. And they basically have the control over the node and get votes on the network for that. And you don't actually get any power. This is how the centralization of proof of stake works. And it becomes more centralized as this figure goes higher. So let's say it was 100 ETH. That would be way higher, way more capital to put into the node to actually start staking it and getting a vote on the network. So, so far, 28 million Ethereum has been staked. I believe that's around 15 to maybe 17% of the supply of Ethereum overall. So in terms of mining, obviously, we know it moved to proof of stake to address the gas fees. Just a quick overall it didn't actually solve that. And in turn, it also made it heavily centralized due to the Ethereum staking limit, which is 32 Ethereum at the lowest end. And we've seen a decent amount of the supply actually being staked. The only problem with proof of stake is that if everyone stakes all their coins, then nobody really wins. There's no net gain for anyone if everyone stakes their coins. The only gain you can make in Ethereum and with proof of stake coins is the fact that nobody else would be staking. So because there's only a certain amount of supply, it does make it beneficial to stake Ethereum. But if it's said, 
120 million Ethereum staked, then there'd basically be no net gain over competition in terms of the staking rewards. Now, when it comes down to market cap, Casper is currently 2.2 billion. I don't believe it's at 44 anymore. I believe it's at 40, but that obviously changes with current market prices and the market cap of Casper coin overall. And then with Ethereum, obviously we have 304 billion, which is second place, as we all know. We don't have anything that's probably going to take over Ethereum anytime soon. We have BNB, which is only at 46 billion. So apart from Tether, there's nothing else that can really overtake Ethereum looking forward into the future. This is one of the main reasons why Ethereum does so well and why Bitcoin has done so well, even though the underlying technology isn't the best out there, is because they got into the game early. So for example, when we're comparing these two, Casper coin looks to be a way better technology. However, they don't have the time in the actual market to solidify themselves to be better than Ethereum or Bitcoin. And they're also more known, so people are going to know about them more. They're going to use them more. They're not going to be trusting a smaller coin like Casper coin. When it comes down to supply, kind of into the mining part as well, Casper has 28.7 billion. As we saw with this emission schedule, if we scroll all the way down, we have 28.5 billion there. Supply doesn't necessarily matter in this terms because Ethereum has an infinite supply. It more depends on the emissions of a network. The reason that Ethereum doesn't necessarily look so good as well in those terms is because it does have an infinite supply. So when we look here and we click on Ethereum, you can see the max supply it says right there is infinity. So currently 120 million, but the max supply is infinity. And then there's around 18 million more Ethereum produced per day. So the reason that this necessarily isn't good is because you're increasing the supply, but you're not burning as much Ethereum to cover the loss. So Ethereum's price shouldn't necessarily be going up in those terms because you're not burning as much as you're increasing the supply, therefore inflating the price of the currency which should in turn actually lower the price of the whole coin overall. And Ethereum burn total is around 4 million, and that's a chunk out of this 120 million that we have here. So only 116 million circulating, as we've burned 4 million in total. So this doesn't necessarily catch up with the 18 million that is produced per year. However, Ethereum supply is going to be infinite. You know, there might be proposals in the future, but as I said, the centralization talk about Ethereum basically means it's a for-profit coin, and those people who hold the nodes or the 32 Ethereum to stake into the nodes get the vote on the network. So they're not going to vote to have a max supply and start doing an emission schedule right now because it would not be beneficial for them. Now, in terms of development for Casper coin, obviously we have loads in development. We have the Rust update, we have the Dagnite protocol, we have some other things. These are just further increased blocks per second and transactions per second. So this is on top of the Rust update, I believe. Integration for Ledger, the archival node improvement, which is trying to recover some of the missed transactions in the early days as nobody had an archival node. They're still trying to put that together, so they're actively working on that. And then obviously their last one is the smart contracts implementation. Now, the smart contracts and the Rust is going to be the two things that people are going to be looking for in terms of Casper coin, because Ethereum already has this full development cycle gone, as in they've pretty much developed as much as they wanted to. They're only adding little bits in now. With Casper coin, we're adding major things in terms of the Rust update, in terms of the smart contracts. We obviously want smart contracts because we can open up an ecosystem and start building upon Casper coin, and that's obviously going to bring value into the network in turn, you know, you can create dApps and NFTs and everything you wanted to on the Casper network, as opposed to using it on a proof of stake network like Ethereum or Solana or Avalanche. So that's the comparison between Ethereum and Casper coin. Overall, I'd say Casper coin definitely has better technology. However, there needs to be implementation of this Rust update and the smart contracts and the Dagnite protocol and it needs to come through relatively flawlessly for it to succeed in the space. Ethereum already has time in the game, so they did all this, you know, five, six years ago, and now this move to proof of stake probably wasn't the best for them, as it didn't actually fix the problem that they were addressing. But only time will tell if other coins can actually overtake Ethereum, 
That would probably be a big thing in the space. We don't think that anything's going to overtake Bitcoin just because it's the first that has real notoriety in the space. And Ethereum was close second to that. You know, it came out a couple of years after. So they have time in the game, which is obviously more important to people right now because they have a brand name and people know it. So it's only a matter of time before Casper Coin kind of gets out there. And then we can see it start climbing through the ranks. It was at, I believe, 23 in terms of the market cap at some point. However, nowhere near Ethereum. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. If you have any opinions, leave them in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this.